Hey, this morning, if you have a Bible, let me invite you to open your Bibles up. I want you to open them up to Ephesians chapter 5, and I also want you to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're talking again on our third message, so if you're brand new here today, you're a little bit behind, but this is the third message on what is called the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ. It's really more of a reward seat than it is judgment. There's no judgment there, uh, but that's what they call it in Scripture is a Bema. We're going to talk about that today, but before we do, I want to thank you for your giving to our One for One last week. Uh, we collected right at $3,900. And it is going, we always try to send it off to some, either an organization, a group, or an individual that can keep things moving. And sometimes it is uh, really awesome things going on, and sometimes it can be some tragedy that's going on. I don't know how many of you have ever had the need for, or one of your family members had a need for a rescue squad, but if you've ever needed that, you know that when you dial 911, you expect them to show up at the door. And sometimes those people, they come and they rescue and they save lives, and we don't know who they are, what their names are. But this, this month, our one-for-one one is going off to the New Hanover County Rescue uh, Team, and it's going to a specific person on there. And, and the reason that it's going to a specific person, her name is Lisa Stoffel, is she's been a, a rescue person for a long, long time. A long time. She's, she's given her life over to rescuing people. She had a stomach ache a, a few weeks ago. She ended up going to the hospital for a stomach ache. They took her into surgery. When she came out, uh, she was missing half of her insides. Found out that she had a very significant uh, rare cancer and a long, long, long recovery. And so her family, because she's, uh, she's young, uh, very young, her family just got hit. Boom. They're done. They're out, you know. And so it's going that way to help support them as she travels back and forth to uh, Chapel Hill or Duke and does chemotherapies and all the other kind of stuff that goes on. So I want you to know uh, where your money goes. We never keep any of it. We always ship it out. And so thank you for giving, okay? Give yourself an applause for your own giving. You should be grateful for that. I want to let you know that the 8 o'clock crowd could not listen fast enough to even get half the message in. So I'm going to assume since you guys listen slower that we're probably only going to get about that far. But I really do today want to talk to you about this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. I hate that it's called that because it always gives this idea of judgment. Whenever we say the judgment seat of Christ, it is the translation of a single Greek word, bema. And that was found in the city of Corinth. If you've ever watched the Olympics, when you see the people crawl up on the platform, gold, silver, bronze, that platform they're standing on is the bema. So it's a seat of reward. It's a place where we receive our rewards, or it can be a seat of loss, but it's not a seat of judgment. It's not punitive. There's no punishment that goes on there. But I want to make sure, considering that this is an eternal situation, that when you get there, that you have reward that's coming your way. I don't want you to suffer loss. And the cool thing about being in the church is, unlike the Olympics, there can only be one winner at this every one of you can be a winner. So I want to make sure that you come to the table with something before God that he can say, yep, uh, you get reward for that, okay? So let's talk about this this morning. It's the third message on this Bema. The first one I tried to help you understand that you are going to be held accountable for your life, and that accountability for life is going to result in either reward or loss, okay? That's how it's going to be. Uh, how tragic it would be to get to the end of life and realize you could have had all this and in reality, you only had that much or none at all. So it's going to result in that, and how God is going to measure that is by your life. Not by mine, by yours. He will judge mine by mine. Secondly, though, the second message I tried to share with you guys, well, how does God do this? How does he measure or how does he evaluate our life out there? And he does so by your work, by your words, by your motives, by your accomplishments for him. It's been a whole message on that. And today, though, I want to deal with a very different issue. It's the final message or the final passage of Scripture that deals with the Bema seat judgment. 
And it deals with what I consider the most startling truth to which we're going to be held to account. Every message that I've brought to you has dealt with something different. When I talked to you out of Romans and I was talking about being held to account, it was in the context of us criticizing our brothers, be them a younger brother or a more mature brother. The mature brother was uh, judging the younger brother or despising the younger brother. And the younger, more, less mature brother was despising the older brother. And he says, hey guys, don't do that. Don't despise and don't judge because you're all going to the judgment. So recognize there's an accountability. It was in that context. The second message was in the context of, well, how is he going to look at the things that you do? Because sometimes we get a little particular about how, well, I did exactly this way. And God says, I'm looking beyond exactly what you did. I'm looking at why you did it. I'm going to look at your motive. I'm going to listen to the words of your mouth over the course of your whole life, what your words express about how you feel. And they're going to demonstrate the motive behind it. That's what he was dealing with. Today, I'm dealing with what you're going to be evaluated on. Not your works, but what is the thing? What is the thing that God is looking at that he says, whenever I measure and evaluate every single person, there is one thing, one, that I'm going to measure them against. It's the church. George Barna, his group, a research group, he recently released information on church attendance. He said after COVID, the church attendance dramatically dropped, dramatically. But whenever they polled the pre-attenders of church who had COVID or were out from COVID, they did not say that they were not coming back to church because of COVID. They said, we're not coming back to church because we don't think church is important anymore. That's an organization created by man. There's a whole lot of people on, on the internet that have said church is not important. Church attendance is not important. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to give. You don't have to serve. And it's irrelevant to us. It doesn't meet our needs. I don't like their music. I don't like the preaching. I don't like where it is. I like sleeping on Saturday morning or Sunday morning. I don't want to travel. I don't want to drive. I don't want to dress up. They had all kinds of reasons as to why they were not coming. They just didn't feel it wasn't important anymore. What if it is? What if it is the thing, and I'm telling you, the only thing you're going to be judged on? And that's exactly what he says. The church. We're going to talk about that. Listen to what the Bible says about the church as far as God's concerned. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says this. As Paul was speaking to the elders there near Ephesus, he said this. He said, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I want you to think about this for a second. Back on the 4th of July, there was a tragic shooting at a 4th of July parade. Just it's ridiculous that somebody would even think about shooting people, especially innocent people. But there was a situation in one of the persons that died, a husband and a wife who died, and one of their children that did make it through. The father was wrapped up around the child and was shot to death protecting the child. The mother was shot to death protecting the child. This child is, is very, very young. They won't really remember, I don't think, their mom and dad. They're too young to remember. But as they grow up, let me tell you what the story will be as this child grows up. Your mom and dad gave their life for you. Not accidentally, not accidentally, purposefully. Purposefully. They did everything they could to shelter you. The dad had to know, if the shooting is coming and bullets are coming, the bullet won't penetrate my body and get to my son. I'm going to take care of him and the mom the same way. And so they both died. And here's this child's going to raise up as an orphan. But not really, not really because they have the knowledge that their child was protected and will continue on because of their sacrifice. Jesus purchased you with his own blood, not accidentally, purposefully. He thinks something of us. In Ephesians chapter 5, 
where I've asked you to turn, verse 25 through 27, this is a very typical marriage passage. Listen to what it says. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she should be holy and without blemish. And then he says a whole lot of other stuff. But in verse 32, he says this, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So when God was writing all these things, when Paul was penning these words, he was making us aware that how God, how Jesus Christ and his church relate to one another is exactly the way that he wants husbands and wives to relate to one another by virtue of role and position and all those types of things, submission and obedience and so forth, that these have a purpose to them. They are not to devalue. They are to cause a success to happen out there in the world. And so as Paul writes these words, he reminds us that this is not just a thought in the mind of Christ. This was a sacrifice on his behalf to buy us. And so the church is very important to Jesus Christ. I want you to be aware that the Bema seat is an individual evaluation for each of us, but it is not about any of us individually. It is an evaluation for us as a body, as a church, as the bride of Christ, because the church is the bride of Christ. And I don't know if I have conveyed this to you the way that I should, but we are all moving toward a wedding. That's where we're headed. We're headed to a wedding. We're headed to the wedding supper, and we're headed to the wedding chamber, and we're headed to this great marriage of Christ and his church. And what's supposed to be happening is that we, as the bride of Christ, are getting prepared for this wedding. And so as God looks at this judgment or this evaluation, he is basically saying, here's what I need to do. I need to get ready to make sure that my bride is ready. And when my bride gets here, she better be ready. She better be ready. If there's one thing that I think is kind of cool when I do a wedding is I'm back in the back often with a groom, but from time to time I will uh, go and see if the bride is doing okay. And sometimes the the groom or the groomsman will say, "Uh, what time is the wedding going to start? And I always tell them the same thing, when the bride is ready. I'm like, no, 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 no. On the, on the invitation, it said this was at 3 o'clock. I'm like, I don't care what the invitation said. <laughs> this thing will start when the bride is ready. Sometimes they'll say, well, we're waiting on the mother-in-law. No, you're not. The bride is waiting on the mother-in-law, and the bride's not ready until the mother-in-law's here. Okay? It's when the bride is ready. What I also think is so cool is to see on this one singular day, to watch where this uh, beautiful young lady is being attended to by all of her friends. And they're trying to make sure that there's not a wrinkle in the dress, that the hair is perfect, that their shoes are just right, that everybody's there, that they've had a chance to talk. They're preparing the bride. I always love to see whenever the grooms, the bride, the bridegroom, the groom comes around the corner and sees the bride for the first time. And that, that look, that look on their face of like, oh man, this is, it's unbelievable that that's going to be my bride. See, that's what Christ wants. We're supposed to be preparing as the bride. What is it going to look like when Christ returns to get his bride? What is the bride going to look like. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm speaking to those in the back right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. I got to cut some because it was just too long at morning service. Paul says this, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, and here's the, here's the essence of what we're after today. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. 
if anyone's work which he has, uh, it, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So we're starting to talk about the nature of what something is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved so as by fire. I'm not going to get to all that in, but I do want you to see that the basic thing that I'm dealing with here is that there's going to be either gain or loss, and that gain or loss is going to be determined by whether you have built with gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. That's the basic essence of what we're saying here. Gain or loss is going to be determined by the nature of these things that you're building with, the building material. What I want you to hear is that Paul is not talking about works here. Okay? We dealt with works. We dealt with works. That deals with our motive, deals with our words, deals with the accomplishments that we had, the things that we've done. He's not talking about works here. He's talking about material things. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind for just a moment. I want you to see if you can pick out, because this passage has been preached many times, we've got to keep it in its context of the book of 1 Corinthians. You cannot pull it out and just come down and start looking at wood, hay, and stubble and gold, silver, precious stone. I want to keep it in its context. I want you to see what the real issue here is, and it is this. It is an unsuccessful church. The issue that's going on for the Apostle Paul is an unsuccessful church. Paul planted this church. He established this church. He founded this church. He went away. He came back. And the church that he founded is not the church that he came back to. What he initially started is not what's continuing on. And not only is it not the church that he left, but the direction that it is going is not a direction that is ultimately going to end up in a holy and righteous bride for Jesus Christ. In fact, it's going to end up to be something totally different. And so he's coming back to a chat to challenge the leadership of the church specifically. Now, every one of us are involved in this because he includes us and has inclusive language, but his major focus is on those who are leading the church. So we have an unsuccessful church here, and they're unsuccessful for a reason. And here's the reason, and this is the context. I wish you'd go back and read all of this. Paul starts out in 1 Corinthians with this one premise. There's two ways to lead a church, by the wisdom of man or the wisdom of God. You can either listen to what the world has taught, or you can listen to what God says. Now, the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God is miles apart. As a matter of fact, when you listen to something that is so thrilling over here in the world, when you bring God's opinion on it, guess what the world thinks? Not, no, nah, that's not good. That's a little, no, it's foolishness. That's how far away the wisdom of God is from the wisdom of the world. The word used there is the word moroni, where we get our word moron or moronic. And so they're saying, boy, whenever I look at the world over here, these are brilliant people. But what God says, God's an idiot. That's just foolish. God says you can lead a church in one of two ways. You can either lead it by the wisdom of the world or you can lead it by the wisdom of God. Here's the problem. When you lead it by the wisdom of the world, it results in division. It results in factions. It results in little groups. And when that happens, we don't have a body we got a whole bunch of entities out there that are non-cooperative with each other and they are destroying each other. Insert another principle, a body divided against itself cannot stand. And so Paul already recognizes this church is on this road to collapse. And it's on to its road to collapse because it has chosen to adopt the wisdom of the world because leaders have come in that are worldly leaders as opposed to spiritual leaders, and they are destroying the very church that he's trying to build, which happens to be the bride of Christ. And we're going to be answerable for the bride of Christ whenever Jesus himself returns. And so here it is. This is the challenge. The result of worldly leadership is division. The result of division is a failing and carnal church. The result of a failing and carnal church is loss at the Bema. So we've got to turn around. We've got to do some work on the church. And more importantly, we've got to do work on the leaders. Because the truth of the matter is, what Paul is dealing with here is celebrity. He's dealing with celebrity leaders 
who have usurped the glory of God. And we've got people that are following celebrity leaders and no longer following Jesus. That's the problem. That is the problem. Today, I think that the church is filled with celebrity leaders who can say things that are clearly against the Word of God and factions of people follow because they are starstruck by the celebrity. And God says, ah, Jesus may seem foolish. The cross may seem foolish. Everything I'm teaching may seem foolish, but I'm telling you it's the only eternal thing out there, and we've got to pay attention to it. So let me just um, let me deal with however far we're going to get. <laughs> number one, number one, as Paul deals with this, and remember we're dealing with the church and worldly wisdom, worldly leaders don't need Jesus and won't lead you to Jesus. Worldly leaders don't need Jesus, won't lead you to Jesus. Hey, can I tell you something? When you come in here, it would be my desire, this really would be my desire, that everybody would walk in here with an actual Bible. Like, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the phone and the iPad. I'm not opposed to that. I, you know, however you got it, it's great with me. But I remember a long, long time ago in church one time, our pastor stood up here and, and he said, uh, if you have a Bible, hold it up and shake it at the devil. And I like 95% oh, like of the people had a Bible. Today, we, you know, we have other methods, and I'm good with that. But I'll tell you what, it's hard to keep the Bible in context when you only see a few words on a screen. There's something about flipping pages, man. There really there is. There's something different about that. And so the thing is that if we can get you away from the Scripture, I can lead any way I want to. If I can get you away from the Word of God, or if I can get you to believe the Word of God in a twisted way, I can do anything that I want to. If you don't believe me, ever listen to a lawyer when he goes to court and they, uh, well, they got him off on a technicality. And you're like, yeah, they're guilty of sin. Yeah, but they didn't, you know, they, they, they searched them and they didn't get the search warrant just right. They didn't say the right. Yeah, but they, we, they're, they're on camera. They shot them in the back. Yeah, but they, you know, that film was illegally. So, so, so the murder is okay because this person accidentally didn't get a signature. Right? That's how that works. And worldly leaders figure out ways to make sure that they remain worldly leaders. They make sure that they remain in their spot. They make sure that they are enamored by everybody else. The Bible says this, according, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, according to the grace, I want you to read this real carefully with me. According to the grace of God that was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. First thing Paul says is, before you, before you start paying attention to me, everything I told you was given to me. Did come from me. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. This was given to me by the grace of God. Okay. So as a wise master builder, why am I a wise master builder? Because I'm wise. No, because the, the word that I got came from God, which is a wise word. So I'm going to build on his word, which makes me a wise master builder. And he says, I've laid the foundation and another person builds on it. Here's what Paul is saying. He says, I planted this church. I founded this church. I walked away. When I walked away to go somewhere else, somebody else came in and started building on the foundation that I had first laid down for you. He said, but whoever builds on it, let him take heed how he builds on it because no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here's what happened. Some of these teachers came in and they started to remove Jesus from the foundation. Not unlike what we do. Because sometimes we do exactly the same thing. We don't necessarily want to talk to Jesus because what Jesus said sometimes is not exactly what we want to hear. It's not exactly the way he want, we want to do it. And so we've, if we can just push him to the side a little bit. Let me tell you what happens. Because these are celebrity leaders, then they have fame. Fame stunts the growth of the follower. If you take a look at a famous person and their followers, they'll always remain followers. Because they feel like they can never attain to the fame. There's a big difference. 
There's a big difference between a person seeking fame who always has to be elevated. And if you always have to be elevated, you can't elevate anybody else. Because if you do and bring them up next to you, you lose your fame. So you got to keep them down. So fame will always stump the growth of a follower. They'll always make sure that they only, here's a statement. Well, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. Where does that come from? That's worldly wisdom right there. Sometimes I've, I've cooked some really good food. Someone said, would you give me the recipe? Yeah. Is it a family secret? It's a family recipe. Is it a secret? Why would it be a secret? I'll tell you what it is so that you can enjoy it. The only problem is if it's a Chinese resp- recipe and you're not Chinese, it ain't going to turn out the same way. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> I think our measuring is different. When we think, because y'all have like really wide open eyes, and so it probably looks like. <laughs> I thought it was a half an ounce. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's how God made me. I just seen if y'all were available here with me this morning. The fame stunts our growth. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to what Paul says. This is all in the same book. Listen to what he said. Those, now these things, these things, what things was Paul talking about? Paul said this. He said, hey, whoever, water, whoever plants and whoever waters are exactly the same thing. They're just one. It, but they get nothing. It's God who gives the increase. He's talking like in that language. And then he says this. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes so that you can learn in us not to think beyond what is written that none of you may be puffed up on the behalf of one against another. So here's what Paul said. He said, I, here's what I've done. I'm using me and Apollos as an illustration. Why am I doing that? The same reason that when I call out a name today, it is usually Joe or Mike or Clyde or one of my staff somewhere or or potentially myself or one of our family. I remember I use a lot of personal illustration because I got, you know, stuff happens in my life all the time. And I had a person one time that said, Pastor, I love the way you use personal illustration. I want you to know that you know a lot about my life. If there's anything in my life that you feel like you can use, please feel free. You have carte blanche. I thought they meant it. (laughs) So I did it one time and I was like, never again. I don't think that they understood the ramifications of me calling their name out in a public forum and all the comment and stuff that they would get. And so then it's like, ah, I can't do that anymore. So now I'll talk about Joe a lot because Joe, I love Joe. He's easy to pick on, but Joe is also an incredible man of God. He's got a strong countenance and he never gets mad at me. And so that helps a whole lot that I can use him. And Mike Morley, I mean, he's beyond question. We just pick on him because he's Mike Morley. (laughs) And you just get to do that. But he doesn't ever get mad either. So here's what Paul said. I'm using Apollos and myself to show you a principle so that you can see that principle in us so that we could transfer that principle to you. And what is that principle? That you don't ever think that you're better than somebody else because of what you do. The person who planted, the person who watered, what? Neither one of them anything. God is what it's all about. So the preacher over here, is he any different than the the nursery worker? No. God's not going to say, well, Pastor Kenny, because you were the preacher, you get all these special rewards. No. He's going to say, you did your part. They did their part back there in the nursery. Took both of you to make it happen. You're both the same. Nothing that you did came from you in the first place, came from me. And so Jesus gets the reward. It's like you got to understand that. And and in this context with these worldly leaders, there was always a sense and and a a desire to always elevate one person over another. He's like, we're not going to do that. He then says in verse 7, who makes you differ from one another? What do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast like you didn't? Do you see his point? Do you see what he's saying? That they're like, oh, I got some special stuff from God. Well, maybe you did, but you got it from God and you happen to be a conduit. So God gets the credit. If you take this Bible out of my hand, let me tell you what I got to say to you guys. 
Not much. About the only thing I'm talking about is road rage. <laughs> Listen, all I have going on in my life right now is church, caring for my wife, and road rage. <laughs> That's all I got. I still don't understand. How many of you don't know what the left lane is for? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> How about that turning light? Do you, when it goes green, <laughs> there's people behind you. They're trying to get through the light. <laughs> that's right, that's good preaching right there. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's good stuff. Listen to what Paul says. Uh, loyalty begins with Jesus, not leaders. You have no reason to be loyal to me. If I'm teaching the word truthfully, if I'm being honest in what I'm doing, I'm treating the way I suppose, then I hope there's a measure of loyalty. But the minute that I step outside of that, you have no reason for loyalty to me. None whatsoever. Your loyalty should rest with Jesus Christ every single day time. Listen to what he says. He says, now I say this, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And how challenging is that list? Because Jesus Christ happens to be in the list, so he's a choice. He's one choice in four. Really? How did we ever come to him being one choice in four? He's the only choice that there is. And so Paul comes behind and he says, can I ask a question? Is Christ divided? Is Christ divided into Paul, Cephas, and, and Apollos? Of course not. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul says, I'm grateful that I hardly baptized anybody. I baptized one person, but I didn't baptize them in the name of Paul. Didn't baptize them in the name of Apollos. Didn't baptize them in the name of Cephas. And so our focus always has to be, and our loyalty always has to be with Jesus. It always has to be. What's going on? These leaders have come in. They have moved Jesus off the foundation, and they've put something else in its place. How many things can be put in the place of Jesus' foundation? Think about this for a moment. How about denomination? That's the biggest one, denomination. You start calling out denominations. We're Baptists. I don't know how many Baptists there are. There's like over 800 different categorizations of Baptists. That means that there's at least 800 things that Baptists didn't like in the Bible, so they created a new denomination to get around the thing they didn't like, or there's something that they wanted to do, and so they created a new denomination to get that in there. And there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, only the Baptists are going to heaven. What has a Baptist got to do with going to heaven? What has that got to do with going to heaven? Either you've trusted Jesus or you haven't, Period. That, that would be a challenge considering that the Baptists didn't show up until the Great Reformation in the 17th century. And so since it was the 17th century, I don't know what all those people did. I guess they were condemned to hell for, 17, for 1,600 years until the Baptists showed up. I thought salvation was in Jesus Christ, not the Baptist church or the Methodist church or the Catholic church or any of those other churches. But how many people do you know that will get so mad if you mention something about their denomination? If you get real mad about that, it ought to talk to you about where your foundation is. And unfortunately, some of us are not going to make it because your denomination is not going to get you in the door. I promise you. In fact, it might keep you out of the door. If it keeps people out of this church, what makes you think it's going to get them into heaven? Just a thought. Number two, worldly wisdom exalts human leaders. Spiritual wisdom grows God's church, builds God's church. So you would almost think that I would say, hey, uh, worldly wisdom exalts human leaders and spiritual wisdom exalts Jesus Christ. No, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It builds God's church. Christ never asked to be exalted. God said, hey, listen, there's a day of exaltation for you. It's coming. Don't worry about it. The day is coming. You're going to be exalted. Christ knew that. Christ is not battling for a day of exaltation. As a matter of fact, Christ spent his whole time here in humiliation. He came to humble himself so that God could be seen. And the challenge of worldly leadership is, man, we got to have a name for ourselves, don't we? 
got to put our name on a t-shirt, got to put our name on a book. We got to do that kind of stuff, got to sell and all those kind of things. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but whenever it gets above Jesus, there's a problem with that. There are a lot of churches not known by Jesus. There's a lot of churches known by their pastors. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's like, hey man, do you understand that this is the bride of Christ? This is the bride of Christ. And we're to be building up the bride of Christ, not your reputation. When Paul was writing the book of Philippians, he said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. And he says to us, that's what I want you to do. I want you to have that same mind where you recognize, man, this is not about us. This is about Jesus. And we need to make sure that we are of no reputation and we exalt his bride, prepare his bride, and doing that exalts Jesus. So in 1 Corinthians 3, he says this, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw. I'm going to stop right there. I'm not going to finish that passage because I just want to deal with the materials that he's dealing with here. And remember, the issue is wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. The leader who chooses worldly wisdom builds a church in a very different way than the leader who builds the church with spiritual wisdom. Don't call out any names or, or, or raise your hand. But have any of you ever been a part of a church where business people got a hold of the church? And it's not that they were bad people because I love business people. But they decided the church needed to be built upon business principles instead of spiritual wisdom. There's a difference, by the way. There's a big difference. Rob Strickland was just telling me that his uncle used to tell him this. He said, here's how you know that a good deal happened between two people. When both walk away, this was, uh, somebody told him this, whenever both walk away feeling like they've shafted the other person. <laughs> That's called worldly wisdom. Okay, worldly wisdom. Interestingly enough, today, if we can do anything to destroy a person's character, to destroy their reputation, to destroy their life, that's what we want to do. That's a methodology that we're using today in the world in order to promote our agenda, right? You know what I'm talking about in the world. If there's anybody that's coming against an agenda the world has, how do they fight against that? They make sure if you even raise a voice to stand for something different, they're going to do their best to cause you to lose your job, to cause you to lose your reputation, to cause you to lose your hope in the world, to absolutely tear you down in everything that they can. Because the worldly wisdom is crush them before they crush you. Spiritual wisdom is, hey, love your enemies. If a person falls, for those of you who are mature, restore them. Restore them. Here's a question. In a church, do we operate by worldly wisdom or do we operate by the world's wisdom? So let's take somebody who's had a failure in the church. Their marriage didn't work out. Well, God says you're not supposed to have divorce. That's exactly right. He does. No doubt about it. I would agree with you that way. Six ways to Sunday. But when a divorce happens, what does God tell us to do? Forgive and restore. Is that what we do? Well, I can't believe that Pastor Kenny is still letting them do this, that, or the other. What am I supposed to do? Kick them out? Where do you, uh, hey, hey, brother, go out in the world where the devil is, and when you get better, 
you'd be welcome to come back in here. Church has nothing for you to help you get better. We expect the world to get you better, and now you're filled with the world's wisdom. Come back here and help us lead. That is not how you do it. Now, there has to be parameters, and we've got to be careful and all those kind of things, and we've got to love on them, we've got to pray for them, we've got to make a place for them to go. But we're supposed to restore. So you can imagine that whenever there is a failure in the church, God says, this is my bride, this is my body. This is could you imagine if you could take the analogy of the bride of Christ and just think of, think of us as a single body, as a single person, and i got a cut on my arm. It's like, oh, boy, give me the cleaver. I can see us coming up to the, the wedding. <laughs> what happened? Well, Lord, we knew that you didn't want any of that kind of stuff in there. Think about it. It's the wisdom of the world. There are two ways that God says you can build his church. Two ways. He said you can either build it eternally or you can build it temporarily. He gave two different kinds of the quality. He says they're gonna, you're gonna, your stuff is going to be checked for what? What is, what is it? What nature is it? Of what sort is it? What is the actual makeup of this? The gold, silver, precious stone, there's a reason for that. I'm not going to get to it today. The wood, and straw, but it, t- it demonstrates two natures, eternally and temporally. Eternally and temporally, okay? Just hang on to that for just a second. I want you to think about this for just a minute. What's the difference between the two? Well, we can say eternal is going to last and temporary is not going to last. That's true, but it does change the way things are going to be. For example, typical churches, let's take something to be nice and controversial so you don't talk about when we leave. (laughs) Let me tell you what a temporal church builds on. Tradition. See, the temporary church doesn't think about the generation that you're never, ever, 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 ever going to see or know because you're going to be dead. But somewhere out there in the future, if Christ does not come back and he tarries for another 150 or 200 years, there'll be a pastor leading the church at Northside and it won't be me, I'll be dead. The environment that he'll be leading it in will be different than the environment I'm leading it in because the world will have changed. The question is, will I have built a platform for him to step onto so that he can go ahead and go to the next level Or will I say, "Uh uh-uh, we're tearing down every ladder, we're tearing down every rope up to the ceiling, we're tearing down everything, and we're going to work on this one single flat platform because we want it the way we want it and the way we like it, and that's the way it's going to be. We call that wood, hay, and stubble. It's temporary. It's never going anywhere. It doesn't reach anyone. If today you would fuss about a millennial, would anybody fuss about a millennial? Somebody might. If you would, let me ask you this question. What is the methodology to reach them, or have you even considered it? You're going to be dead one day. Every time I have a birthday, my statement is always the same. It's like, Pastor Kenny, you're you're this old? Yeah, I'm going to be dead soon. (laughs) You're like, there's something wrong with it. God said, teach me to number my days. Teach me the number of my days so that I know how many days I got left to do something, right? To do something. And he says, now, for these leaders, a lot of times leaders will build temporarily because they don't care. Have you ever noticed? Here's one of the worst things in the world whenever I see, uh, especially in church leaders of the church, whatever day it is that God calls me away, I hope it's not for a long time. Now, you may want it to be sooner, but I'm praying that God's going to give me a lot, a lot, a lot of years. But whatever time it is that God ever takes me out of here, I promise you, whoever's coming behind me, I'm going to make sure that I make the transition easy. I'm going to make sure that I try to give you everything that I've got before I go. The temporary leader, as soon as they're gone, Is that, is that eternal? So let me just leave you with a thought. What is the gold, silver, precious stone? What is the wood, hay, and stubble? They're not works. They're people. They're people. God tells us that we are a body, that we are a temple, and that we are a bride. 
He uses three analogies for his church. We recognize that in every one of those analogies that there is a beginning state of it and a completed state of it. That it's not just stagnant right where it's at. When it comes to the building, we're building it. This building that is here has hundreds of thousands of pieces to this building, but you don't see them as 100,000 pieces. You see it as the building. When you look in your body, your body has over 4 trillion cells in your body. But you don't see your body as 4 trillion cells. You, you don't see me as 4 trillion people. You see me as Kenny. God does not look at his body individually as you guys. He looks at us all together. And we're supposed to be building this church. Listen to what he says about how he builds us. The apostle Peter says the same thing that Paul says, but he says it in a different language that verifies and also complements what Paul said. First Peter chapter two, verse four, he says, we're coming to Jesus as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter says, hey, I want you to know that what God is doing with you, each one of you are like a living stone, and he is placing it to build up his temple the way he wants to build it. And the whole reason that he did is because he's looking for a place that he can inhabit on earth and that the spiritual sacrifices should come this way. This is how a church is supposed to be built. But when it comes to a worldly leader, we build it on fame, we build it on fortune, we build it on contemporary stuff. And when I say contemporary, I don't mean, I'm not talking about me, I'm just whatever's popular today or something like that. But it doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with what God said. And he said, you're going to be judged for this bride that you offer up in that last day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says this, do you not know that you're the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God's going to destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. He wants you to know what you are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says this, speaking in the context of, of sexual immorality and the people that were just, they're saved, but they're living a debaucherous sexual life. And he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let me tell you what Paul was saying previous today. He says, do you guys not understand that if you're going to bed with a prostitute, that you are connecting that prostitute with the Spirit of God. That the Bible did not say the two shall become one flesh for any reason. That's a spiritual union. Whenever the sexual activity takes place, it brings together a oneness and a union. And he says, you guys seem to have forgotten that in the physical realm, when you have sex with another person, you join together as one. And when you do that there, you cause Christ to be connected to a harlot because you went a whoring. Do you understand that? I want you to think about bringing the bride of Christ up there to the groom. Says, well, how is she? She's great, man. We just had a bachelor party for her, and she just had about 55 guys run a chain. There she is. God said, I'm telling you right now, when we come before the Bema, I'll tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a leadership who recognized who I was. And who recognized who they were and who recognized who my bride was. And they treated her like the bride she is. They didn't treat her as a commodity to be prostituted for my gain. Boy, how, you remember when the maddest Jesus ever got, he walked over to the church and they had turned the house of God into a marketplace. He flipped over all the tables. Jesus sat down. The Bible says he sat down and constructed a, a whip. Jesus did. I'm going to go in there and beat the fire out of them people for what they've done to my bride. And think about us sometimes, how we prostitute the church of Jesus Christ to make money and get stuff in or, or for fame or fortune of a particular leader. He says, I'm telling you, when you, guys, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, God says, this is what you're going to be measured against this body. This body. How we doing? Now, that's not just, he's talking about leaders, he's talking about me, and that's why I want to make sure that I always teach you the truth. But at the same time, hey, how engaged are you? Are you helping build the body? Are you helping to build it? Or are you tearing it down? Because listen, if you're tearing it down, 
The Bible says God doesn't like that at all. He doesn't. And so we have to continue to maintain our spiritual leadership, our spiritual worship, not only from a leadership standpoint, but from your standpoint, you have to stay in there. I tell you this because one day when you stand before the throne of God and you're thinking, oh, well, I, I handed out a drink of water, and so that's gold, silver, precious stone. No, 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 no. God's talking about this gold, silver, precious stone. It's people. Wood, hay, and stubble is people. Let me read you one passage of Scripture, and I'm out. Matthew chapter 13. Listen very carefully to what Jesus said. This is the word, red letter edition, Jesus' words. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And you know that, that wheat and tares, they look identically the same. You cannot tell until they come to fruition and harvest what it actually is. It says, but when the grain is sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared. And the word really is the word re were revealed. And so it's not like they just showed up. It's that it was revealed that they were actually a tear. They didn't know until then. So the servants of the owners came to him and said to him, sir, do you not, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said, the enemy's done this. The servant said to him, well, then do you want us to go gather them up? I mean, he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat in them. Let them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them into bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You know what he just said? You gather the wood, hay, and the straw together, and you also gather the gold and the silver and the precious stone together. And the people that were genuine wheat, we're going to keep, and the people that were tares, we're going to burn their people. If you're a false leader, it results in false Christians. And false Christians don't go to heaven. I'm telling you today that you were born lost. You were born lost. Not of any fault of your own. You were born lost. That's the way you were just that way. You were born lost. The sin that you committed to be condemned to hell for all of eternity is being born there is not a single activity or sin that you've ever committed that is going to condemn you to hell. Not one. Not one. Your birth condemns you to hell. That's why you got to be born again. Because it's your birth that was the problem. It's your birth that is the answer. All of the sins that you commit are God's way of making you aware that you have the nature of sin and have not been born again. So that you know. You can't do a thing about it, so stop trying. Since you couldn't do a thing about it, he did something for it, for you. He sent Jesus to the cross at Calvary to die for your sins and mine, completely past, present, and future. He said it's a choice that you have to make. You have to ask to receive it. He offers it to you. If you want it, here's how you receive it. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. Just like that. We're all saved the same way. There's not a Baptist way to get saved. There's not a Catholic way to get saved. There's a Bible way to get saved, and it's through Jesus. If you've done that, you're gold, silver, or precious stone. If you've not, you're wood, hay, or stubble. Where God's going to hold me accountable in this regard. Hey, did you tell them the truth about salvation? Even if you made them mad, did you tell them the truth? Did you let them know that they were going to hell? Did you let them know what they had to do not to go to hell? Did you do it in a way that they could understand? Did you make sure that it wasn't about the church, that it was about the Christ? Did you make sure that it wasn't about the money, but it was about the master? Did you make sure that it wasn't about their hospitality, but it was about heaven? Did you make sure, because if you didn't, if you didn't, and you're a believer, you're going to suffer loss. What's the loss? The loss is the people. My dad was on his way to hell. He died in 2005. Two years before he died, he came to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Guess what? Guess what? I will not suffer the loss of my dad of my mom, of my four brothers, of my cousins, of my nephews, of my nieces, of my friends, of my son, of my mother-in-law, of my father-in-law, of my brother-in-laws. You want to know why? I told them about 
Jesus until they received him. I didn't just, let me tell you about this so that I'm not held accountable. No, you need to get saved. And I told him until I almost beat him into submission. <laughs> You're going to hell. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It's like, man, God loves you. And God loves you. And I pray you'll give him an opportunity to trust him.